This episode of Artist Decoded is brought to you by No Wave Academy. As creatives and artists, we have each personally experienced the turbulent road of artistic self-improvement. And as the co-founder of the LA-based artist collective, No Wave and No Wave Academy, I can tell you that our objective is to offer an alternative path to a traditional arts education. No Wave Academy courses are taught by some of our favorite artists. They're also our personal heroes and colleagues. Some of these artists you may have heard on this very podcast, while others have been featured in exhibitions at the No Wave Gallery. Such artists include Casey Baugh, Mia Bergeron, Nick Rungi, Sean Cheatham, and Kate Zambrano, to name a few. All of our instructors are working professional artists that have been showcased in galleries and museums, both locally and around the world. At No Wave Academy, we work tirelessly towards evolving the way you learn and to expand your artistic passion and craft from the very best in the field. We believe that everyone has a unique artistic spirit. With guidance, experience, and the proper tools, students have the ability to invigorate and elevate their work. You can unlock and unblock your creative inner voice. Join us and walk into the next chapter of your personal artistic evolution. Go to nowaveacademy.com, that's N-O-H waveacademy.com, type in AD-10 at checkout for 10% off. Now, on to the episode. Hey everyone, welcome to Artist Decoded. This is your host, Yoshino. My guest today is American representational sculptor and artist, Brian Booth Craig. Recently, I've had the pleasure of getting to know him over the past few months. We've had multiple phone conversations where we talk about film, art, and literature. I remember our first conversation was very energetic where we were able to openly express our perspectives on politics and socioeconomic ideas, for instance. And it was a very exploratory conversation. So I wanted to channel that energy and understanding into this conversation. We also have been bouncing ideas off of each other and have been giving each other books to read revolving around the study of psychology, but more specifically about childhood trauma. Brian also reminded me of the book, The Drama of the Gifted Child by Alice Miller, which has come up in the past with many conversations I've had with friends, but I finally felt compelled enough to buy the book after Brian mentioned it to me in a few of our conversations. It's a very good read if you're interested in unraveling childhood trauma, even if it isn't from a personal perspective per se, but maybe it's a way for you to connect on a deeper level with your friends and peers, or to understand your significant other better, and to strike up a conversation maybe. It's also a book that's helpful in untangling negative unconscious actions and emotional complications that can be felt in the present and specifically talks about the interactions between a parent and a child that can manifest these sorts of feelings and emotions later on in life when we become adults. I've been really enjoying my conversations with Brian. They're rich and full of life. We talk a bit about plant medicines in this episode too, which Brian and I both know is a very popular topic in our contemporary world to talk about which can also venture into the pop spiritualist side of things. But nevertheless, we try to dissect the nuance of the topic and how it relates to his art practice. He educated me a bit on 19th century forms and the idea of artistic facture in sculpture. I thought this idea was really interesting too because of an attention to detail while creating a piece of artwork but also because the way we tied together facture and sculpture to a responsibility in shaping oneself. And if you're a parent, the responsibility of shaping one's child or children, for instance. So we talk about that. And certain questions come up when I think about this as well, such as when does the ego get too heavily involved? When should we let go of the process 
Or when does the essence of control of a substrate, for instance, allow us to dive deeper into our craft? Or when should we destroy it and wipe the surface clean? Well, obviously, there's many questions to explore here, but let's dive right into the episode. So before we explore the mind meld that's about to happen here, I'd like to ask for everyone to take the time to leave us a review on iTunes. It really helps for listeners just like yourself to find out about Artist Decoded. A person just like yourself, kind of like you, but in a different form maybe, a mold if you will, and for the context of this episode, maybe a sculptural body of clay which disperses and recontextualizes itself into a subatomic form. And maybe you think, has it been you all along? When looking into the abyss, does it look back? Huh? Nietzsche? No? Maybe? No, I don't know. Anyways. All right. Without further ado and the distractible jargon, here's my conversation with sculptor and artist Brian Booth Craig. Hope you enjoy it. taking this time to be on Artist Decoded. Thank you for having me, Sheena. This is going to be a pleasure. It's uh, been enjoyable getting to know you and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Definitely. Yeah, me too. Yeah, we've had um, lots of conversations about various subjects, um, some dealing with uh, books that we've both read on childhood trauma and psychology. And we've also talked about poetry and psychedelics. And I was just thinking of you know, just the conversations that we've had in the past and how, yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be great just to have an exploratory, another exploratory conversation for the pod. But before we get into the more exploratory side, I was thinking that we can get into your background a bit sure, and how you got into being a sculptor. And I know that you were studying pre-med back in college, but then what was the transitional point where you found sculpting as your art form? Well, I, uh, I always was making art. Uh, when I was a child, my mom took me to a local artist to take drawing lessons, uh, drawing and painting lessons. Uh, it was a woman who had an, a studio in her basement, and I did that for a few years. And then uh, she took me into uh, Pittsburgh, which is where I grew up. I grew up in the Pittsburgh area. She took, she'd take me into the uh, Carnegie Museum of Art. Mm-hmm. They had uh, after school and Saturday morning art classes. Uh, same thing that Andy Warhol did when he was a kid. He used to take those same same sorts of after school Mm. courses at the Carnegie Museum of Art. And so I did that for a long time up until high school. Uh, So I was always making art and I knew I was an artist, but I had never uh, experienced sculpture before. And when I got into college, I was, I was drifting around. I, I, I was, you know, moving from major to major in, in university. I actually was in school for, for six years undergrad. I think I graduated something like 180 credits, (laughs) which is, which is, yeah, you know, two years more than you actually need. Yeah. Uh, why? Why do you think you were doing that? Just to explore, or you know, I, I, I think there was. There's certainly a part of it was like I was just addicted to learning and I wanted to explore things. That was a part of it, but I do think a large part of it was the a fear about being an artist. I think there was there was a um, sort of cultural narrative which was that if you become an artist you're going to starve to death and you're not going to have you need to have a backup plan like everybody hears that sort of thing now the funny thing is i didn't get that from my family i didn't get that from my from my parents my mother was very supportive and in fact she was the one who pushed me to go back to studying art she Mm. you know after a few years in university she said when are you going to start making art again and uh, I was more dissuaded because of my experiences in high school, you know, guidance counselors saying, well, you can't make a living doing that. What do you, you know, don't do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which of course is, I think it's a pretty common narrative. Most, a lot of people get that from their families and um, it's a cultural narrative that that's fairly prevalent, especially back then. But uh, I, I didn't even know, to be honest, I didn't know that art schools even existed. Like I didn't know there were such things as schools where you could just go study art. Mm-hmm. This is pre-internet time, you know, be- yeah. before internet was prevalent in the way it is now and where things are so easy to find, discover, you can, there's so much knowledge and opportunity to meet people and, and, and explore that didn't exist back then. So I didn't even know that there were programs, there were schools where you could go and study specifically study uh, art. And so I was at Penn State University and uh, I drifted around different majors. I was really thinking of, like I said, pre-med. And uh, 
And then I decided I, I, this is what I should be doing, making art. And I took a sculpture class and it felt natural. And so I started a little late. I was probably started sculpting in my, like, like around 22, 23, mm-hmm. somewhere in there. I uh, started doing this, at least this particular kind of work. Uh, the, the program, uh, and like most art programs today, was, was fairly conceptual. And there was not really any kind of figuration, representation taught. There was, I think, one figure drawing class, which is really just an open figure drawing session. You go in and, and play around. So I, uh, I came to it kind of late, this particular genre of sculpting, but it, it felt natural. Uh, I took to it pretty, pretty quickly and fairly easily. So I, it wasn't, it, like I said, it wasn't, I think it was partly me wanting to explore lots of different intellectual pursuits. I'm, I'm a big reader. I read a lot. I'm, I'm a very curious person, but it was partly also just the, the fear of, you know, what, what is it, what does it mean to be an artist? I didn't have any kind of mentors or people to show me mm. that it was possible. Uh, yeah. and I think that delayed me somewhat. Mm. What do you think it is about representational art in particular that drew you to it? And what, why do you think it continues to draw you in? What parts of it? Right. Uh, at, the, at the time that I switched over to, to being a, an art major in university, I was looking at a couple of artists in particular. I was looking at Antony Gormley quite a bit. And he's, his, his approach to, to art making and sculpting was very philosophical. He was very much interested in the way in which the body has an internal narrative quality. Right? That it's not. It's not just. There's not just an external narrative to, to art. There's an internal narrative, but and there's a material narrative. And he was, he was very, and he still is very interested in those ideas. That the body has its own has its own story to tell, and that the materiality of sculpture is a narrative also. And so I think it was that that intellectual pursuit that he was pursuing through uh, representing himself. Of course, they were all body casts. These weren't modeled form these weren't what would be called willed form right taking a material and turning it into another form he was he was doing something more indexical where he was putting uh plaster on and removing it and doing cast of his body hmm. but nonetheless it it i think it it appealed to my that intellectual side to me of me and the other part of it that i think appealed to me and still does to this day both of these things appeal to me but this second part i think is maybe the more impactful one which is that the the that internal narrative has an emotional component too, and it, it, it it's that pursuit that I think has sustained me and been the abiding thing that has drawn me in, and uh, and I think there's a, a unique quality to the to representation and its ability to communicate human narratives. It's not the only way, of course, um, and of course the other the other an- way to answer that is that it it felt natural to me and when I you know as soon as I did something in clay and representationally it just kind of flowed out easily and other pursuits that i that i was involved with sculpturally that were non-representational seemed seemed a little bit more of a struggle it didn't seem as natural now having said that i you know if i had stuck with it maybe i would have found a way to find a language a sculptural language that was non-representational that would have explored the ideas that i was interested in but but ultimately, the, the, the body seemed like a, a still a rich territory to, to explore. And I also think that there was a, um, there, was a, a, there was a story at the time, which was that, that representation was passe and that it had no more to, to say. This was in the 90s back. This is prior to what we know now, which is a sort of an explosion of representational forms, both painting and sculpting, drawing and so forth. Uh, at the time, that was that that was the story, which is that representation had was passe. As soon as somebody says you can't do something, I'm like inclined to think that yeah, there's some, there, maybe I, that's what I should pursue. <laughs> you know, mm. I'm a little uh, like not contrarian about things, but I I feel like that 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 makes me want to push back a little bit, right? Yeah. So somebody says you can't do this. But you know, so it's a combination of things. I don't, I don't think there's any one answer to that. And in truth, I've found that the more I've done it, the more I've engaged myself in the activity of uh, looking at human activity and behavior and uh, and the body and all of its different forms, the more I've found to explore. So I think that aside from those initial 
initial reasons for maybe pursuing it, I've found other things along the way that, uh, that I wouldn't necessarily have, have known if I hadn't, hadn't delved into it. I mean, in truth, any art form that one chooses is rich with material. We have, you know, human beings haven't reached the bottom of that well for anything. And so, uh, the meaning will come from a pursuit if you're, if you're deeply engaged in it and, and aware of yourself and also responsive to what the process is telling you. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, that sounds very much like part of that internal narrative that you're talking about is being aware of yourself and your observations and your reflections on things and being able to incorporate that into your artwork. And I was wondering, because, you know, we were talking about traditional representations and, you know, trying to, I'm going to say break out of it or more, maybe not so much break out of it, but finding your own unique spin on what's been taught for the past. Because when you go to school, uh, if you go to art school or something, you're going to be I mean, I think we've talked about this, about your learning from 19th century representational forms and the construction of that. But then how do you find yourself doing something more unique to yourself as an artist, as opposed to doing Mm -hmm. something that is more like you working on a craft? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Because I think this is a dilemma that a lot of people within this field face, because the, there's there's a long antecedent history of doing representation, right? As particularly in the Western art forms that we're familiar with, and that history can be somewhat of a burden, not not intentionally so, but by virtue of the fact that anything that you have to learn that takes a great deal of skill and time in time pursuing it means that you're going to you're going to start you're going to learn from those, those antecedents and they're going to, they're going to infiltrate whatever intentions you have. And so uh, it actually took me a long time to figure out how to, how to both respect that tradition, but try to break away from it. It took me quite a while. In fact, when I first, when I first finished, le- left school uh, and I had all these skills, I didn't really make any of my own art for probably five or six years. I, I started working as a as a studio assistant to Audrey Flack and stayed doing that for quite a few years for ten over ten years. And in the first half of that period, I didn't make I didn't make things, but it wasn't because I suddenly was disillusioned with it or anything. I, I didn't know how to match the form or the process that I was that I had spent so much time teaching myself and the ideas that seemed more contemporary. They didn't they didn't they just didn't uh mesh right and in i think it was during that period working for her that i started to figure it out i started to understand ways that i could represent the the body that were that were dealing with contemporary ways of thinking of the of human nature okay now one of the ways i i started to do that was marrying my interest in uh philosophy and psychology with my with the sculpting techniques that I was utilizing. Now, I think, for example, I didn't, I was, I started out doing these self-portraits, one behind me right there. It's, it's seri- I did a whole series of self-portraits and you can clearly see the lineage of the modeling technique. But at the same time, I was doing something very unclassical in a certain sense, which is, so for example, the, even the notion of doing a self-portrait in ancient Greece would have been, cons- been considered unacceptable. You just didn't represent yourself. You're supposed to represent ideals. And those were universal ideals. So that was one way I was breaking away from it. The second was that I was also trying to find methodologies that didn't, that didn't come from a 19th century tradition per se. So for example, and this, there, there is a little bit of a, of a, a precedent for this, which is in the realist movement, realism of 19th century, meaning the, the historical movement, not a technique. I mean, people oftentimes get those things confused in that they were depicting things as they were. Okay. So there were two movements in in the 19th century. There was a classicism, which then was rebelled against in romanticism, which then developed a naturalistic, realistic approach to, to art making. And the, and so the, what I was doing in thinking about it in a contemporary fashion was not depicting things 
in a realistic fashion, say, for example, you know, somebody shoveling dirt, right? Or you know, doing some everyday activity, which is what the realist movement was about. It's like depicting people as they were, but also not doing the opposite, which is the, the, the classical, which was to speak about uni- universal ideals. You know, the, what's the famous saying, saying Corbet said, I, I cannot paint an angel for I've never seen one, right? Something like that, you know, right? Um, so, yeah. so, so, I'm, yeah, so trying to find the, the, the place between those two, because the reality is that when you're depicting something sculpturally, a person representing a, a, an experience with another person, it is a, it is an unrealistic activity. Like, in other words, you, it's not something that everyday people would encounter, Right. In fact, I, I'm sure all my neighbors think I'm crazy. You know, it's the guy who's like has naked people in a studio and making these clay figures <laughs> right, <laughs> up three in the morning, like banging on bronze, whatever it might be. Yeah. It's not a it's not a it's not a quotidian activity. So so I found the pathway for me was to uh, once I stopped, once I got out of doing the self portraits, I found the pathway for me was just to have a person in the studio and respond to all of the all of the movements or or gestures that they would that they would enact in the studio and find some sort of narrative quality in that so i i wanted to represent people as they appeared to me but also ha- as they as they depicted themselves in a in an age with an agency that would not have been present in the 19th century so it's not so much about technique. See, I think you can use any technique that was mm-hmm. used in the past and and turn it on its head a little bit or use it in a new way. So it's not about technique. I think that's that's the one thing I would want people to understand in what I'm saying is that it's not as if I was trying to invent a whole new method of building clay sculptures, right? Mm-hmm. That's not what I mean. What I mean is more about the the activity of looking and interacting. Mm-hmm. So for example, one of the things I often often will say is that you know i as a i'm not i'm not speaking for somebody else right so so it, you know in in the 19th century if somebody got a commission they were speaking on behalf of these public ideals right mm-hmm. or they were speaking on behalf of a the realist movement was actually built upon a social movement right uh the, which was that the, which was to try to elevate the position of the common person it was it was it was a reaction against um this the the right the the reassertion of the monarchies in France, right? And so they were trying to they were trying to depict people in a way that had both a a, a realistic effect, but also what had a political purpose. Okay, mm-hmm. whether that was whether again whether that was Courbet or uh, or you know uh, Dalou or it could have been. Uh, in writing, Emil Zola, right, would have been the example of a, a writer who was mm-hmm. trying to depict people as they were, but also had a political uh, impulse behind it. But I don't, I don't think artists. Uh, this is this is the way I approach it. I'm not speaking for my subjects. All, I'm speaking about about an experience with another human being, mm-hmm. or an, about an experience in my body. I'm not taking an advocacy position. It's it's more of a, a, a responsive position, and. So I wanted, for example, if I use a female model, I wanted them to have, a, I wanted them to depict their agency, right? They weren't a tool of the artist or a tool of society. They were something I'm responding to. Does that make sense? And yeah, so it makes sense. That's how, I've, that's how I found the middle. That's how I found the middle path there. And now, of course, whether I've succeeded or not is not <laughs> up to me to, to decide, right? Yeah. I have to, as an artist, you have to, you have to, Put it into the world and and see how other people interact with those ideas via objects, images, and so that's been my that's been my approach to it is to mm-hmm. think of it not so much on a technical level, but uh, well, there is a technical level, level to it. But but thinking about the solution of the the problem of, of representation on a philosophical level, like what does it mean to represent things? What does it mean to 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 work with with uh, with subjects that are representative of some some idea in the culture? Like that, I think that's the way the way to think about it. How do you think that you know? I mean, because essentially what you're doing is you're stating your intention for your journey and the reason why you create these forms, and you know you're you're not you're saying that 
it's not like you're trying to create completely new techniques necessarily, but it's more so about mm-hmm. your perspective and bringing a more contemporary perspective onto the subject matter. Is that correct? Right. Correct. Yeah, you got it. Exactly. That's precisely right. Now I should back up a little bit there because the technical part of it, the, the manipulation of material, it is a component to, to, because there is a material narrative to things. Okay. So the way in which something's made the factual quality of it, the factor, meaning this is a popular term in, that was developed in the 19th century. The factor factor is the, is the, the evidence of the means of making, Okay, so if you think of, say, a very fa- a highly factual painting would be, say, like Jenny Savile or Lucian Freud in terms of representation, right? It's a highly, or, or Jackson Pollock, right? You can see the way it's made in the, in the material itself that's, as it sits on the canvas. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and sculpture could be the, the fingerprint, okay, on the surface of the clay or whatever it might be, or mm-hmm. a tool mark in the, bra- in the marble, okay? Mm-hmm. That's, the, that's the factual character of the of the pro of the of the image or object now that factual quality is a kind of narrative right it's a it's a narrative of the of the artist interacting with their world mm-hmm. and it's an imprint the factu- right it's an imprint right it's an imprint um and now there are various ways you can leave a factual narrative in the final uh final piece and sometimes you can, you can like, you can erase those tracks a little bit and that is part of the narrative. Right. And so, so, uh, so there is a a sense in which the, the technique does have a connection to the, to the other component. In other words, they're inseparable. The way something is made is inseparable from the meaning that it conveys and the intentions of the artist. You know, in other words, you can't swap out one technique for another, I, I always talk about this with people who who want to just imitate the 19th century, and I say, well, you you want to bring all of the luggage without the baggage, right? You can't, you can't have it both ways. Yeah. You, know, you have to you have to you have to think about what those techniques and methodologies for representing things meant. They had a meaning. They weren't simply arbitrary. They weren't. So, for example, if you say um, impressionist painting, they're they're representing the idea of light. Right. That's part of the that's a key concept. And so the way that they they painted was was not arbitrary. It was completely those two things were interdependent. You remove one and the other one falls apart. Okay. so so having said that, I'm not trying to reinvent techniques. It's not so much that I I wasn't aware of it. I just wasn't starting at at the point of fetishizing a technique for its own means, right? For its own, per- for that, for that was as if that was the end. What made, what, what made you come to that realization? Do you think it was the utilization of psychedelics? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. No, the, that came, that actually came much before my utilization of psychedelics. Psychedel- mm-hmm. My utilization of psychedelics is a whole other sort of personal narrative that, but however, I think it is deeply connected to what I'm interested in pursuing artistically right now. Uh, but no, the, I think the realization of that idea really goes back to my uh, original university education when I was at Penn State University. I had a the the chair of the department at the time. His name's Tom McGovern. He's now I think he's working in Kentucky now at a university. He was a, a dean there. His his entire approach to sculpt to art making and sculpting was engaged with uh, with process art and uh, the ways in which the material. You, you, you have to engage, he was interested in material culture and process art and the ways in which you're engaging with the material says something about the culture you live in, okay? Hmm. And that was, uh, even though we weren't doing any kind of representation in his courses, he made us think deeply about these ideas, you know, that, that materials aren't neutral. That they, they say something about the culture that we live in. And I mean, we know this by looking at these, right? This thing this course, phone, the phone for those people who aren't yeah. watching the video. Right. Um, that's a sort of an obvious example, but it also holds true for, for, you know, the, the, the materials of life. And, and so I think that's where that began really that, that understanding the truck, the trouble I had when I first left school was I didn't know how to connect that with the idea of representation. They seemed very, they seemed very separate, right. Mm. They seemed like I couldn't, like, for example, like that, the, uh, when you're, when you're studying representation, you have a model, right? You draw the model, yeah. right? 
but in the past, you know, in the past, they always had a, they always had a, 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 a goal that they would try to achieve. So for example, if they were commissioned to do a, a sculpture of a saint, right. Then the model became part of the process of, of reaching that goal. Right. So, but, but I realized that the, that there wasn't a, a general cultural narrative that I could, that I could grab onto to, to, to reach my end goal. All I had was the process of you have a model there and now what do you do? Right. Mm-hmm. And when that, when I was confronted with that dilemma, I just, it, it stopped me in my tracks pretty, pretty severely actually, because I thought, well, I, I, what's the point of hiring a model? I don't have any ideas hmm. without understanding that without understanding, but that, that I had it backwards, that meaning comes from making meaning comes from making. So at, once I realized that, and I just would have somebody come in the studio and start working and I just started responding to what they were, who they were in this environment mm. in, in their interaction with me. And what's the, what does it mean to look at somebody? What does it mean to have them look back at you? What does it mean to yeah. represent that experience in clay? Yeah. Suddenly it opened the doors because now I was no longer, I was no longer projecting some idea, but finding the idea in the process. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So it sounds, it sounds like, it sounds like through your studies and then, all, but also, you know, so you're un- getting an understanding of how to utilize the media. And once yeah, you yeah. have understood that, then, you know, I, I have this, I don't know if it's my theory necessarily, mm-hmm. but I think that a lot of people are results oriented. And I feel like we mm-hmm. live in a society that is results oriented. So the way that we may do things has to like, or the reason for doing a particular thing has to have a specific result instead of being present with the situation. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like you, you know, have a model over your studio and then now you're much more observant of maybe the way that someone positions himself or the way that mm-hmm. they move or, you know, the sadness in their face or, you know, certain things that depict an internal quality, which is what you're talking about, like the internal and external world, right? Oh, absolutely. And grasping from what you're saying is that, that, that presence. Anyways, yeah. go on. Yeah. And I, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think you, I think you're 100% correct about that, that we are incredibly results oriented culture. And to, to, to great detriment, I think, in, in many regards, not just in art making, uh, this, I think it, this has an effect on everything that we do in, negatively uh, because we've, we've become very imbalanced in that. I think you're, I think you're 100% correct. And it was also part of the reason I, I got so stuck early on because I, w- I had an idea in my head and I wanted to make it. And when I hit roadblocks in the process of making it, my response was, the process is broken and I would destroy the piece and try to start something new. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had it backwards. I had it backwards. I'm much more interested in the process now. In fact, I'm addicted to the process. That's how much I love it. You know, if it now, obviously I want to make a product so that I can, so that I can display it and hopefully sell something and engage other people in, 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 in the process. In fact, I almost see the, the product as an extension of the process. So, because, because an object, an object or an image isn't finished until there's a viewer, it doesn't yeah. exist. It's, it, it's not a finished work of art until there's a viewer, somebody to engage with it in a different way. And so, so once I start, once I let go of that idea of that, that the product was a thing that I had to control. It's, I use the analogy of raising a child, like a good child rearing, isn't saying you're going to be a doctor and you're going to do, you know, you're going to do what I say, you know, that's Mm. not that now that may naturally happen to fit the child, but that's more of an accident than it is, you know, than it is the the genius of your prognostication of their personality (laughs) in some future, (laughs) future life. Right. Sure. Um, And so in some ways, I think it's very analogous to that, like having raising children is responding. It's mostly responding and saying, okay, what is, what is it that they're bringing to this, to this experience of life that I'm observing and hopefully guiding properly? Art making is very much the same thing to me. So as a thing starts to emerge, um, it's my job as an artist to respond to it, not to dictate to it what to be. Mm -hmm. And it's much more fun that way. It's freeing. Hmm. No, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe, um, 
tying in what you do and also, you know, you taking care of, uh, you said you have two daughters. Is that correct? Yeah. I have two daughters. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, and 13 um, and 16. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I think the, the more that we can let go of the idea of control, the more that we can actually be observant and mm-hmm. learn and understand and, you know, help push, you know, in terms of, helping you know your daughters like um gearing them more towards certain things that they're interested in the more that we can actually listen to mm. the things that they're interested in as opposed to projecting our internal yeah. values onto them and then making right. it you know essentially trying to control them which is interesting because you know we think about the process of what you were talking about about being very process oriented with your artwork and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that there's been like many aspects in I'm, I'm like I'm trying I'm trying to tie, tie this together and I know I know that, 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 that I think I'm I know for, where you're going. I think for, I know where you're going. You're I'm, on a good path. That's I'm true. formulating this <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> yeah, as as we speak. But, you know, I mean, I, you could look at child as like uh, you know, a child comes with their own sort of personality and you know, you can think about mm-hmm. that in terms of like the material and mm. you know the uh, a material for which you do it will react in a certain way right and and that's just the way that it mm. will be so it's like how do you mold that person and then how do you mold your you know also you know transform your understanding of how to parent into into something that's symbiotic you know so i think about that in terms of right i've been thinking about this idea of just non-compartmentalization and what i mean by that is mm a lot of the times we tend to compartmentalize certain things. So either we won't get hurt, you know, like the, Mm. what we were talking about before Mm. on the phone with, um, you know, childhood trauma or just trauma in general and compartmentalizing that, but that's actually Mm. much more detrimental to us in the future or, you know, our future selves, if we can't unravel that, which. And integrate it. And integrate it. Exactly. Um, Yeah. 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 That's, that's actually, I'm I'm glad you're talking about this because it's a good segue into that topic, that subject. Because I, well, there are two things I thought of when you're when you're explaining that. One is um, that process. One is that we can never t- entirely get out of the way. But that's one of the that's one of the difficult things about being a parent and also being an artist is that no matter how much you th- you are are expressing the fact that you are engaged in the pro like you're interested in the process that the process is everything. You still have you still have projections, right? There's no way to not do that because all you have is your own experience by which to, by which to understand the world. So when I have, say my children, for example, is a good analogy with art making it, I can, I can pay, do as much as I, as I possibly can in observing them and trying to guide them according to their natural, you know, uh, uh, inclinations. But there's no way for me to not inject myself a little bit in there because all I have is my own experience. And all I can say, all I can do is respond to what I'm observing with them yeah. from my point of view. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the reality is, this is what, one of the things I got interested in doing the self-portraits was the reality is that our own experience is a highly subjective thing as well. You know, we, we think we're objective about what we've experienced, but the reality is we're not. We're, we're highly subjective. We weigh things differently than other people who observe us do. We, we have... Uh, we have a misperception about the world that's not, you know, it's it's inaccurate, misperception about ourselves. And so, so the work is, of course, to try to find a way to engage with other people that is um, honest about that fact and, and, and attempting to, to guide things in an, in, a, in an organic way, but ex- acknowledging that we have all of these other things that are, are, influencing the process and that's holds true for art this is where the we're talking about childhood traumas is so fascinating to me because they are i've learned a lot about life from being an artist and uh and vice versa and the in some ways that that process of developing your artistic voice and your artistic process is analogous to the the way in which we have to unpack childhood traumas uh and and how how confusing those traumas can be, uh, and th- that's the same same for art making. You know, there's a there's a lot that goes into the the development of an individual as an artist that 
is not entirely intentional in their in their pursuit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you can't just have one without the other. I mean, it's all, I mean, that's, you know, going back to the non-compartmentalization thing. It's mm-hmm. the more that you're in touch with yourself and your natural inclinations, the more that, I mean, you know, you've even talked about this um, with that book from Alice Miller, The Drama of the Gifted Child. Mm-hmm. And a big mm-hmm. part of that book is about losing touch with yourself because as a child, you are so concerned with essentially being the parent for your mother or father or a parent, you know? So, and so you would put your personal needs aside and Mm. yeah. And I think the more that we can really be in touch with ourselves and be instinctual and continue to be instinctual, probably the better that we'll be. And I mean, I'm sure you can think of many, ways in your life mm-hmm. or many situations in your life where you've over intellectualized things and went mm-hmm. totally against your natural instinct. And I mean, I think a lot of people can really understand that, which I think if you continue that process, you will just continue to like lose touch with yourself. Right. 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 And I don't think it's necessarily one of the things that's interesting about that book and um, and we talked about like Gabor Mate is sort of the, his, you know, he's taking that, those ideas and going a little further with them. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about that is that traumas aren't necessarily in, uh, intentionally inflicted ones either. Like I had, I had, I had a good, pretty good childhood. You know, there were some things that I won't get into them. There were some things that, <laughs> that, um, that were, were, you know, that my parents made mistakes. Okay. There were some things, but generally speaking, they were just trying to live their lives. And I was, you know, I was a child who didn't have any agency <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, didn't have the, uh, didn't have the means by which to understand the things that were happening to me, right? Which is what everybody's experience is. So everybody has an element of that trauma built into them. And, and as, and when you get older and you, you are trying to interpret and then reintegrate that the parts of you that have you've naturally compartmentalized, which I think probably everybody does to some degree, uh, you you then have to you then have to rethink all of those things that you've made excuses for. She talks about that in the book, where you mm. you know you sort of you say you say oh you know it was okay my childhood was great everything was fine, but the reality is the, the there's a the child inside of you there's an emotional core that that has some pain and hurt that you've you put in like you said put in this compartment somewhere, and and with art making a very similar occurrence can happen where you you assume that everything is a certain way in the, in the way that you've developed the narrative that you've created for yourself in your development as an artist and you compartmentalize those parts. And the reality is that it's not like that. The reality is that there are all kinds of things that happen to you as an artist that are sort of out of your control. You don't know why they happened. You don't know why you had the path that you had. Mm. And you can either, you can either ignore it which is why I think that the um, results oriented thing happens. It's just mm-hmm. much easier to sort of ignore everything and say, okay, I, totally. I'm going to go, go for this result. But I yeah. wonder, so, so this is something that, that I've been thinking about just over the course of like doing this podcast. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll have a myriad of different guests on from people that were known as, you know, quote unquote, like prodigy artists when they were children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, immediately received a lot of accolades um, and success from their craft, whatever it may be. Mm. And mm. sometimes I think, is it, is that, I mean, you know, you can't really, you can't really control if you'll be successful or not. But in terms of just the idea of expressing something that's honest, I wonder if, you know, people that are able to express something that's really honest just didn't lose touch with that child, those childlike sensibilities young. Hmm. And there was no blockage Hmm. there, you know, because I think a lot of the times, I mean, not, not necessarily from like a clinical depression sort of thing, but more of like an external, um, external thing that happens to you that becomes internalized and which draws you further away from yourself. I wonder if that is just what we're trying to unlock is that idea of those childlike sensibilities again, and that we've lost touch with them. Well, that's a good, that's actually a really interesting point. I, I, it's one of those, that one of those conundrums, right? Is it's yeah. how much can, how much can skill actually be an impediment to that? Like, yeah. We've that, talked that's a good about example. that before. Yeah. Like the, yeah. the, um, 
was a uh Werner Herzog that that film Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Oh yeah, Cave of Forgotten Dreams. Yeah. Yeah, how we were talking about that before in terms of, you know, can you really say that there's a progression in I mean there's certainly certain progressions in technique in terms of like representationally being able to like depict someone in a more um quote unquote perfect form, right? But does that actually help and push forward the creation of art making or does it detract from right. it? Right. Right, right, right. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm very skeptical about the notion of progression in relation in relation to art. I think that's just a, yeah, no, now I'm not going to make any, I'm not going to make any firm ideological statement about it, but I'm skeptical about it. And, and my reason, the reason is because of what you just said, I don't know that, um, a new technique necessarily means a progression of art because again, it go, going back to, is it a rep, is it, a, is the technique utilized in such a way that represents something that some important idea that's, that's, that's bubbling up from the person's experience in a culture. Okay. Or, or can it become a sort of gloss over that? Right. And th this is where I, I think that the cave paintings, whenever people ask me like, what do I think the, the greatest leap in, artist, you know, and art history is, I'd say the cave paintings, you know, I mean, the way I would describe it is, you know, that that's, that was the moonshot and everything else since then has just been sort of orbiting the moon, right? We, yeah. you know, the, the reckon, the realization that, that, that human, it's, 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 it's kind of an existential crisis in a way, right? That people became aware of their demise, their eventual demise. They became aware of their temporality. They became aware of, uh, uh, what it meant to be a conscious being. Like you're aware of your awareness. You know, I have two cats sitting here in my studio. They're happy if I feed them. And, you know, my dog's like, she loves to go for a run, run in the woods or whatever. But I don't yeah. think she's thinking about, I better do this now because it's not going to, I'm not going to be here forever. You know, she's in the moment, like completely in the moment. It's what I love about animals. This other animals where animals do, but I love that, 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 that in the moment experience. And the question is, is a new technique an advancement? Not necessarily. I mean, it can be, but it's it 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 depends on on the people utilizing that tool. And th this is why I'm very this is why I, I'm I'm very ecumenical in my approach to looking at art. I don't dismiss anything. I'll look at anything because I always come from come to it with the with the presumption that I'm ignorant in some degree, and I don't know everything about what the artist's intentions were with with the style or technique or whatever it, is it might might be utilizing. Yeah. And and so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a go ahead no go ahead You're no I, I no i think that's i think that's great that you come with that humility that can be lost if we try to project certain things that we actually don't know onto another subject or a person and you know i mean you know which goes back into what we've been talking about before about objectivity and how it's mm -hmm. hard for people to be truly objective right 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 so one of the hardest things about being a teacher honestly uh, te teaching. I, I was a professor for, for uh, over 10 years in Connecticut. And um, one of the hardest things is that you, you're you wanting to teach people techniques that they're clearly there to learn, right? They, they, you're teaching them your approach to making things. And of course, I have my own set of skills and, and, and abilities that I've worked on for many years. That's what they want to learn. But at the same time, I have to recognize that not all of those things are appropriate for that person. Right. And so, so tr trying to help them understand that, that, that in the end, there is no right and wrong artistic technique, only right or wrong for your intentions. Is it the right language for the thing you want to say? Is it the right form for the thing you want to say? Is it, you know, every, every form has an inherent uh, expressive quality. And so I'll, I'll, you, I'll go back a little bit to the, to the, idea I was talking about with, uh, of artistic facture and the factual quality of, of an object or an image. So if you think of sculpture, right, you think of, uh, if there are two, there are two ways you could approach this materiality in clay, right? I could, I could push the clay with my hand, leave my fingerprint and leave the, the, the residue of that action in the, in the material. Okay. The other approach would be, which is what I do, which is I, I erase a lot of that. I erase a lot of my, my, the, the memory of my hand, because what I want to do is I'm, I'm speaking about the act of looking 
and the separation from the subject and the maker and the, the object and the viewer, right? I want to create this sense of tension between the act of looking and the thing that's being looked at. Okay. Now, if I leave my handprint in that, now it's not about that. Now it's not about, it's about, it's about my manual manipulation of the material to represent the thing that I'm looking at. You see? So, of course. so, so that's a simple example of how the, the technique and the action and the materiality and the tools, everything that I'm utilizing has a, has a specificity to its content that yeah. is inherent in the process. Right. Mm -hmm. And so though that's why like teaching is difficult because you want to give people a set of tools that they can, you're basically adding to the toolbox. You want to give them a set of tools, but in the end, they're the ones that have to choose which yeah. tools are appropriate to use. for the thing that they want to explore. Yeah. And yeah. So it's a, it is a dilemma because it, it people, you, it's very easy to fetishize a technique. We all can do it. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and, and I always have to be aware of that. Like, am I, um, how much of this is simply because I know how to do it and how much of it is it really ma marrying well with my, with my, the ideas that I'm exploring? Uh, and am I open to changing if suddenly my ideas want to go in another direction? I'm like, okay, well, I need to find a new way of approaching this, this act of making sculptural objects. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. And so it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating dilemma. And I don't think that there is a right or wrong answer. It's, I think that, I think the answer is in dialogue with your process and a dialogue with other artists and with mm -hmm. the viewers and seeing that the response to what you've, what you've done. And uh, that's kind of addictively exciting. Really. I love that. I love that about art making. It, uh, yeah. It's because there's no end. There's no end to it. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, and who knows what I'll be doing in 10 years. Hmm. I, I certainly don't. I, I hope I don't know because <laughs> yeah. that would mean, that would mean a lot of like laborious, tedious activity just because I, th I think I know what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely. But anyway, yeah. you're going to, you were going to say something in response to that monologue that I just delivered. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, it sounds like you've come to this point of your art making that you understand the intentionality of erasing those fingerprints that you would put onto mm. clay, for mm. instance. And by doing so, you allow someone to have their own relationship with what they're viewing which is something that you creative. So essentially what I'm hearing is that you're also trying to take your ego out of it because you could very intentionally put your fingerprint and then that would be almost like you're taking ownership of the thing that you have created. Is that correct? Right. And also perhaps the subject that I created, you know, that I was looking at or thinking of. Now, having said all that, I don't want to say that there's something negative about that, right? It's not as if I'm saying, oh, you know, taking ownership of that and having the ego be part of that process is a bad thing. Like, I'm not saying that. It's not, it's not a judgment. It's just that the approach that I've taken with these, with the body of work that I've been creating over the last 10 years. Now, yeah, and it's funny because it's funny because as we're, as we're speaking about this, I've actually started doing, I'm getting models in to do more like quick sketches in terracotta that I can, that will leave my hand mark in it. You know, that there's no, I don't know what the, I don't know where it's going to go. I just, I just am doing it out of the, this, this felt need that I, I need to have a, some artistic activity. It's loosening me up again a little bit. Um, I got out of the practice of doing like quick sketches and drawings where I used to draw like all the time. And, um, you know, when you become really, really busy in a studio, particularly a sculpture studio, it's incredibly labor intensive. Uh, if I'm doing mold making, bronze casting, finishing bronze, you know, half my time or more than half of my time is not spent in creative activity, but just in, in the production end of things. Mm -hmm. And that can become, that can become its own little cul-de-sac, emotional cul-de-sac where, you, you know, you totally. start to be, feel like you're being dominated by this activity. And so I, I, I started feeling like I was being, um, sort of, you know, narrowed into this corner of tedious activity because, you know, the thing I like about most about sculpting is the beginning stage where everything's sort of amorphous and just coming into being. And it's a very addictively uh, emergent process. And so I thought, well, I need to do some things that are quite different from all of that pursuit and something that does leave a, the, the mark of my hand and my tool 
and doesn't require all of the mold making and casting and tedious parts of production end. And so, so I'm actually, it's ironic that we were talking about this, that, 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 that my, you know, my former methodology, I'm kind of flipping on its head a little bit just to re feel like I'm re-energizing the process somewhat. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so, so it's not, again, it's not a judgment of one or the other. It's just that I, I became very aware at some point that the mark of my hand on the surface of the pieces that I was doing was not the content. It was the looking and the sense of agency of the, the subject staring back. It's a, you know, that have you ever read um, Elkin's book, uh, the object stares back? Mm -mm. No, I have a great book. Ah, oh, fantastic book. Mm. I'll uh, read it. Yeah. It, yeah, he talks a lot about that idea that, you know, that, that, you know, we, we, the Western view is very much like we, we look at it, we possess the object, right? We possess the thing that we're engaging with, but it's very much about the idea that, that no, the, 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 it's a dialogue between the thing that you're looking at and the viewer. There's another great book called um, Only Connect by John Shearman, who is an art historian. And it's one of the Man Andrew Mellon lecture series. Mm. Uh, books that was published, yeah. right? Uh, I think that he, his was back in the seventies when he gave his lecture and they published the book and his, his, one of the things he talks about in that book is the, the way in which in the Renaissance, they, they assumed that the viewer was not only completing the act of the, uh, the, the art performing its act, performing in space, but they were necessary as a component of the story of the narrative of the story, mm. right? So, so if the viewer's not there, there's actually a character missing. Mm. And the goal of the artist was to connect to the viewer in a much more immersive way, which of course, now we have lots of art forms that are doing that today. Uh, so, but this isn't a new, but that's not a new idea that goes all the way back to the, to, to earlier times. Mm. And even to cave, I think even the cave paintings, that mm. notion, um, it has a ritualistic quality to it. And I, I, that's something that's been a search of mine to try to find that. And uh, it's a little bit difficult because you know, when you're making objects that are going to go into a gallery and then recontextualized into somebody's home, like you, you lose control of a lot of those elements. Totally. Uh, I don't know how many are think about this, but I think about it quite a bit. Yeah. And, uh, um, but um, anyway, I went off on a tangent there. There was, a, there was a point in all of that somewhere. No, it's okay. No, there's, <laughs> there, I, there, 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 there's always a point, but no, I, I understand what you're, what you're saying. Um, so, I want to switch gears just a bit because sure. I did want to talk about psychedelics with you and just some of the teachings that the plant medicine has given you and how that has either recontextualized or made you understand further yourself and the reason and the mm. process for things that you're, that you're doing and the reason why you're creating. Right. Yeah. It's a good question. I would, I like the way you framed it too, where you said you re, re reworded it and said medicine, uh, which I think is important. We talked about this a little bit in our yeah, phone conversation is that, mm -hmm. that it, um, I think it's an important distinction to make because things, everything that you, everything that you consume, whether it's food or medicines or whatever, whatever you see, whatever you're looking at, the way your environment has an effect on your, your psychological, emotional state. And, so I, I treat that all that whole field of of medicine as a uh, an important, almost sacred thing to consider. It's not it's not recreational to me. So that's the framework under which the conversation begins. I think it's important to 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 state that. And you know, th th there is a bit of a zeitgeist here where this is sort of happening with a lot of, lot of, lot of people, people are, you know, microdosing is the, is, you know, yeah, it's definitely a pop thing. spiritualist conversation, but I think it there's, can a, be. there's a lot, it, it, it can be. Yeah. Definitely. It's part yeah, of the it can, cultural zeitgeist, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it can go in that direction. But for me, I, it has been, I've had a couple of experience that experiences in particular that have really released me from a lot of things that, that burdened me. Uh, and I'm still working on all of this, by the way. And it goes back to childhood traumas and senses of uh, my place in the world and, and who I am. And for me, it has a largely personal effect. I'm sure there's a residual effect artistically, although I'm, I'm trying hard not to analyze that too much because 
I, I don't want it to, uh, I don't want it to consciously invade. I want it to, like you said, integrate into what I'm, who I am and what I'm doing as an artist. But uh, it, it, it certainly freed me in, in the sense that I, uh, w- the, the lack of confidence I had in my, who I was as a human being was eliminated somewhat. And, and here's a, I think one of the interesting things about it, about particular psychedelic experiences is that they, they, they dissolve your sense of individuality and, and you're, you, you, you feel connected to the world in a way, or at least you can, if you approach it the right way, you know, this from your own experience, Mm -hmm. it, it, it's an, it's a kind of ego death, not necessarily ego death in the way that we would talk about it in the West, but there is a, it's more of a a dissolution of the self into a larger experience. Mm -hmm. And once you, once you have that experience, you, you, you place less importance on everything that you think about yourself, right? Mm-hmm. They, they, uh, most of those things are self-imposed, those hangups that we have and those, those insecurities. And uh, because it's not the experiences that you have in your life, it's your response to them. And, and whether or not you can, you can stand up for who you really are or not. And, mm-hmm. and whether you compromise your authentic self in order to main, maintain attachments that are unhealthy, right? And so, so for me, that's really was one of the releases. I, I just one of the main things was feeling confidence in myself and who I felt I, who I was and say, eh, I don't have to put up with certain things. You know, I just don't, you know, that there's, there's a certain point at which you, you have to, you have to take hold of your authentic, uh, the search for your authentic self and make that a priority. Right. Definitely. And, and that I think is, is it's obviously a lot of work and it doesn't happen in one experience. And I don't think that's the right message that anybody should send it's a process in the same way that art making is a process, but, but I did gain a significant amount of confidence in, in who I was and what my purpose here is. And, uh, I'm still working on that, but that, that's one of the effects that it had on me. And, um, and also another thing, a lot of this coincided for me with the death of my mother who she died nine years ago. Mm. Um, she died in 2000. Well, it'll be 10 years at the end in, in the fall of this year. And it was dramatic for me because she was such a, an important figure in my life. And, uh, and then I had to confront a lot of other things like my, my issues with my father. I had a lot, my, I grew up a preacher's son. So mm. grew up in a very yeah. religious household and, yeah. and I had a lot, there was a, there was a lot of conflict, internal conflict and external conflict, but there was a lot, mostly internal. I thought, you know, I had this concept that it was external. It was with him. Right. But it wasn't, it was, it wasn't entirely with him. There's a lot of internal conflict. Um, and this is very personal. I can say, I'm not going to say everything. Um, but, sure. um, for a long time, for, for most of my adult life up until like I started dealing with these issues, I would have regular violent dreams about my father. This is a good mm-hmm. example. Okay. And very violent, very, and I'm not a violent person. Like I, I, these heavy conflict con- conflicts in my dreams and, uh, and once I started, once my mother died, I had to start confronting these things. That's when I, that's when a friend of mine introduced me to this psychedelic experience. And it just, I can't go into the whole experience, but it really released a lot of that. And I started like talking to my father and being open with him about some of these feelings. Those dreams never happened again. I haven't had those dreams in probably six or seven years, not yeah. one. They just, they, it was because it was an internal conflict that I, that I hadn't resolved. It was, a, mm-hmm. it was, it was, it was an inability to express myself fully with him. And, and I love my dad. I mean, he's, he's, he's like, like a good human, good man. Like he, he helps people. Yeah. He's generous, but, but you had unresolved sense. trauma Definitely. from the past. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so that's one of the, that's one of the key things it did for me. I don't know what your experience, I'd be curious to hear your experience with that. If that's one of the things that led past you, led, led you on was facing some of those traumas and difficulties. Well, I mean, a lot of this um, research into psychology and neuroscience that I've been doing recently is, um, yeah, I mean, it could partially have to do with certain childhood traumas, um, but it's interesting, you know, just speaking or just, you know, listening to what you were saying, you know, part of Mark Woolen's methodology Mm -hmm. from the book, It Didn't Start With You, he states a lot of the times 
I mean, he even talks about his own personal experience about Mm -hmm. how he had to reconcile a lot of um, differences and things that he encountered when he was young with his parents. And Mm -hmm. he, he did that because he went to a lot of these spiritual teachers and he was trying to fix his eye problem. He had this eye problem where he was going blind in one eye. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, by confronting a lot of the repress, those repressed feelings and being able Mm -hmm. to talk to his parents about that, he actually was able to, and, you know, a lot of doctors said that he would never be able to see again, or it's just going to keep on degenerating, but he was actually able to, through the process of healing those traumas Mm -hmm. was able to regain his eyesight back. And I think it's just interesting also how, we are so connected to our subconscious through our dreams. And a lot of the times the things that we dream and the more that we're in touch with ourselves, more that we can dissect it properly. Those dreams are trying to tell us something about what we're hiding from generally. And yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just, I think it's just fascinating how, you know, it's good, you know, for artists because we have these tools essentially to express ourselves hopefully in the most honest way possible, but there's always work that can be done. And, you know, it's, and it takes years to, you know, to unravel these, these traumas, you know, and yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I don't have any necessarily like conclusions about it, but I like listening to other people's no, stories. I don't yeah. yeah. I like yeah. listening to other people's stories and just trying to understand like why someone thinks a certain way, how they built their ideologies up, you know, from my outside perspective, you know, and my personal opinions, like how can, you know, I help them out or, you know, those sort of things. So yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It is fascinating. You know, in, uh, there are a lot of things there. I mean, there's so much we could unpack with this conversation, this, this idea, you know, what, one of the things with my own experience was that, um, you know, I, like I said, I grew up with my father's a preacher, right? So, I mean, what he says is right. You know, this is the job of a preacher is to, is to express uh, dogmatic principles, right? You can't, you can't get up in, in a, in a Presbyterian church and say, well, maybe this is true. I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, <laughs> this could be, I don't know. It'd like, probably, it'd probably be a different know. religion. <laughs> it'd be a totally different religion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, new, new age so, Christianity or something like that. <laughs> right. Right. So, so when you, when you, uh, my father's a very polemical now, he's very dogmatic, right? And so, but I've taken kind of the opposite tack. I'm much more interested in the questions than the answers because the answers are constantly a moving, it's a, it's a moving object, right? It's a, it's the, the questions keep opening up and opening up and opening up. So like one of the things that I have thought about a lot and, and, and by the way, your interview with Mark was fantastic. I really loved it. And I, I had every intention of reading that, reading the book before you and I talked again, um, but I didn't receive it until Friday. So I just, oh, okay. I just didn't, I, I didn't have time to get into it, but I'm, I'm really, I thought it was a great interview and it's, it really hit on topics that I've been thinking about a lot. And one of the, one of the things that fascinates me about our sense of displacement in the world and the way in which childhood traumas in, infect us now is how much of this is related to being contemporary people that live in societies that are largely uh, disaffecting and disorienting, that are alienating to your sense of self, uh, that we don't have it, we don't have a tribe to give us a sense of purpose and place and a way and a ritualized way of dealing with some of these things. We don't, that, that, that stuff has all been eliminated. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you, you, that, that how much of these kinds of uh, experience issues that we're dealing with are directly the result of uh, a prehistoric brain and body trying to adapt to a world that it didn't, that it didn't grow up in. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. Right. I think there is. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think that's, and I think that's also true, uh, being an artist. I, I, I think I've thought about this a lot that there's a, there is a, a sense of alienation that a lot of artists have because most of our, most of history, creative, per, creative pursuits had a f- societal function that they were, there was a sort of, there was a prescribed realm that was both elevated, but positioned within, within that, that culture. And, 
uh, people knew where they stood. You know, that, so on the one hand, I like what you said about the fact that being artists, we have this means of expressing ourselves. We have this means of uh, getting some of these issues out in the open. But on the other hand, it, it, it puts a great deal of burden on the individual to find a way of connecting with the culture that is decontextualized. Okay. Um, it's one of the reasons why I think public art is so difficult to, to do today because the, the cultural, the cultural milieu that we're in is, has, it's egalitarian and diverse, which on political in a political way, I'm totally in support of, I love, you know, diversity is something that 100% in support of, but it also means that what, what if we don't have a common cultural narrative, what do we speak about? Right. And so it, it becomes a, it essentially becomes about the self and the experience of the self, because it's the, it's the one thing that everybody can relate to. Like mm-hmm. it's the one way that we, as a in language that we can express what we're trying to do as artists mm-hmm. is to say, I'm trying to explore what it means to be a person a self. What is a self? Does a self even exist? Like the self may not even be a thing. It could be a, it's, it's probably just a, a, a structural figment of our imagination to keep us from going insane in a, in, a, in, a, in a very disorienting society. So that becomes the common narrative. But it's, it always seems like a little bit dissatisfying to me, right, in some sense, mm-hmm. um, which, is why, which is one of the reasons why I, sh- I was doing a series of self portraits for a long time. And then I shifted and started doing entirely female figures, right? There's a, there was, this was completely intentional because I got, I started to realize, wait, this is becoming a very solipsistic exercise here, right? That maybe mm-hmm. nobody else understands what, what, what I'm pursuing. Yeah. And so then I started thinking, well, what is the opposite of the self and the self, the opposite of the self is the other, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll never be female. I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'll never have those. What it, I'll never understand what it means to exist in this culture in that body, and uh, so in a certain sense, I was I started doing it simply because I thought, okay, this is this is has I the only way to approach this honestly is to say that I don't understand it, and that all I'm going to do is speak about an interaction and find symbolic ways of representing their own bodily expression. Yeah. Right? What do, you, what do you think about when people ask you, you know, in terms of representing the female form and mm. that in conjunction with the male gaze, like what, what yeah. exactly do you think when a topic like that comes up? I think there are a couple of things that artists, if you're a male artist and you're using female subjects, I think the first thing you have to do is acknowledge it. Like you can't pretend like it doesn't exist. They, in other words, you can't pretend that, that there is a history of a male gaze. I mean, it, it would be ludicrous to pretend that this isn't a real topic, okay? I think a lot of people, unfortunately, want to disassociate themselves from that sort of lineage. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. I, but anyways, to- go on. I totally agree. I totally agree. I think you're 100% right. I think that's the wrong response. I think I agree. the right response should be, no, this, this not only is this a, a part of our history, particularly from the 19th century. I mean, this mo- mostly comes from the 19th century, really, uh, because of the way that the female is depicted and the tradi- and the, the sort of the patriarchal society that developed that, that particular way of looking, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, of course, there's an obvious, there's more to it than just the 19th century, but that's the, the, that's the closest thing to us. And to pretend that it doesn't exist, I think is foolish. Okay, because it does exist. It is a thing, and if you're male and you pre- and you know you're heterosexual male, to pretend that it's not an aspect of enculturation that you've inherited is foolish. So I think the first thing is to acknowledge it. And the second thing is to to uh, to s- acknowledge that it's part of the content of what you're doing. Right, it's inherent in it, and it doesn't mean that it's. In other words, you can speak about something without advocating for it, mm-hmm. okay? And I think that's an important distinction. So on the other hand, you don't have to acknowledge it in a way that is, that is pretending as if that's a, a norm that we want to, want to continue, okay? Mm-hmm. So, so for example, I mean, you, can, you, can, you can make art about anything, it's just what you, how you represent that. So let's like, use a very obvious and dramatic example from human history you can you can make paintings about the holocaust now there's two different there are lots of ways of doing that you could you could be a holocaust denier and and mm-hmm. make paintings that sort of pretend like it wasn't uh, this 
cosmic tragic and and psychologically damaging thing that happened or you can acknowledge that and make that part of the you know part of the content of the work Mm -hmm. and um and so that's my response is to say yes i yeah the male gaze is a historical antecedent that when you're working in this tradition you cannot pretend that it didn't exist yeah the other thing is the other thing is i think really important which has been why i was so in, interested in the, in doing it do, working meaning working with the female subject and working with female models was finding a way to like hand over some of the agency hmm. you know it's sort of like like that that the acknowledging acknowledging their participation and their their the necessity of their participation in the in the in the the making of these things okay mm-hmm. uh, and also uh not um uh, one of the things i don't do is i don't like i don't make passive figures i don't want i don't in other words i want to i don't want to be a voyeur okay so mm-hmm. i want to acknowledge m- my presence in the making of this of this object and so and in some ways i'm playing a little bit of a trick on the viewer because um the the object the final object becomes the proxy for the subject and the viewer becomes the proxy for me mm. yeah <laughs> and interesting and and that's yeah and so that that's part of what i'm exploring is people's own reactions to things you know how are they how are they going to react to it how are they yeah. going to what what is what is their gaze saying you know because they're ga- because everybody is implicated in this right we're all mm-hmm. implicated in this this is a this is a uh, an important cultural moment, yeah. I think, that, that we're in. It's a mm. really important cultural moment, and to mm. to avoid it and to to pretend that it doesn't exist, I think, is is the wrong way. I'm curious. So, I'm curious. Have you? Um, so I'm going to tie this in with this film that I recently saw. And I'm curious if you saw this, but have you seen that film that came out this year with Carey Mulligan? It's called Promising Young Woman. No, I haven't. I haven't seen it. I've heard of it though, but I haven't yeah. seen it. Go ahead, tell me. Uh, well, I mean, I'll give you a short synopsis of it but it's essentially exposing um toxic masculinity um yeah i guess that yeah. would be like a good way to put it uh and i mean it's yeah she basically does that the entire film and mm-hmm. ties it to this instance that happened to her and one of her best friends in college and it basically you know, she was pre-med and then it changed her life. And um, she's on this pursuit to expose, expose these people, you know, these attitudes. Yeah. These, yeah. These behaviors, and these behaviors. Like that. Yeah. That widely exists yeah. within our culture. And yeah. So I don't know. It's just, I brought that film up because it's such a visceral representation of that. And mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. something that um, I don't know, gave such a lasting impression and it strikes up a lot of conversations. Um, I watched it with my girlfriend. I'll definitely watch and it. it. was, yeah, it was, it, I'm curious what you think about that film. But um, I want to ask you one more question. Do you have any advice for artists and creatives? Uh, a couple of things I would say. The first thing is uh, something I touched on already, which is don't, d- don't dismiss the things you don't understand. Right, uh, art. It, it, everybody gets in their lane, so to so to speak. I shouldn't say everybody. It's very common. People get in their lane and they 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 look at what they look at. They like what they like. They dismiss other things. Um, I I say you know be open to like looking at things, even if you don't understand it. Sort of. I, I like to give the benefit of the 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 doubt to the artist, even even art that I sort of conclude I'm not a fan of. I sort of have this thing in the back of my mind that's always just, well, maybe I just don't understand. Maybe I'm just ignorant, right? Maybe there's mm-hmm. a part of me that just doesn't get it. Um, and then there are other things that sometimes I, I, I think I understand them and I still don't like them, but I'll still look at them because I think that's a very important part of being a contemporary artist is to, it can, look, I think we're in one of the most exciting times in art history. I mean, I really truly believe that. Mm. If you look at the diversity of things, the diversity of voices, Go go to go to a hundred years ago. You you weren't going to see contemporary African artists, contemporary South. You know you weren't. You're going to see women making art. You know, it was so narrow, and it was all about the state or the church or you know whatever. It was like it was a very narrow thing. And even when the church and state lost some of its power in the market, and you know say Picasso and Brock started 
cubism. You know, that once those once those fields of endeavor started to to solidify, that became narrow lanes that people stayed in. Now it's it's wide open. There's there's so much great art being made today. I believe. I think it's mm. fantastic. And I so agree. I'd say first first yeah. In fact, I even sometimes will buy art books that are of periods of art that I was never really a fan of just because I want to, I want to say, okay, well, there's something here. There's gotta be, there's something here, right? Mm. There's something you can mine from this and for, for your own benefit. So that's the first thing I would say. Uh, the second thing I would say advice I would give is to do something for your art every day. It's sort of, it's, it's not so much the act of making art every day. That's important. It's, letting it be letting it be part of your your everyday uh activities whether it's reading a book writing notes about projects sketching cleaning your tools cleaning your studio i don't know anything just treat it as if it's another person in the room that deserves like a, a tr like some care and respect like a like a pet you know it needs to be taken care of it needs to be taken for yeah. a walk every day ex exercise it's a simple thing but but uh, once once you get into habit it just becomes a normalized part of your activity. So for young people, I'd say that's a, a, another piece of advice. Um, but I, I mean, I'm hesitant to give general advice to other artists because I think I probably have more to learn than I have to, to give in that regard. But, yeah. uh, but those are two things that I, that I'm always, this is things, these are things that I try to apply to myself. And so that's why I, I, I present it to the world, mm -hmm. take it or leave it. But yeah, uh, yeah. no, yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, I think just that openness in general and being able to, yeah, I don't know. I've just been thinking about just the lost art of listening a lot of the yeah. times recently. And do you think that's a symptom? Do you think that's a symptom of the, of the internet age that we're in? Everybody's, everybody has a voice now. So everybody's used to yelling out what they want or they're, or attacking other people. What do you think that is? I mean, it could be. Uh, it definitely could be a symptom of our age, the technological revolution, if you want to call it that, um, or if rather if I want to call it that, but um, hmm. it could be that it could be because, you know, people are constantly inundated by the technology. It could be also hmm. just patriarchal society that we live in sure. and sure. those views. So it's, you know, in a patriarchal society uh, it's better to, quote unquote, better to be right rather than to be like inquisitive and more um, mm -mm. in yeah. touch, you know, in, in, in touch maybe with uh, your feminine energy. So, yeah, which is yeah. why I think toxic ma masculinity exists and why it's prevalent within yeah. our Western perspective oh, and I culture. Agree. Yeah. I don't know. I think, you know, we live in a, a, yeah. a really interesting, really interesting time right now where there's a lot of these questions mm -hmm. that are coming up and, you know, questions that probably needed to happen many years sure. ago to sure. make things more sure. equal for a, sure. for a lot of sure. people. Sure. But I mean, the tricky, the tricky part there is you know, I, like just in my reaction to that was like, I just suddenly I was like, wait a second, like got to, everybody's coming from a different place, you know? And, you know, I, I think it's important to listen to all those voices and um, well, cause you know, I, I have daughters, so I'm, I'm like, I, I'm terrified all the time thinking about the world that they're going to enter. And so when I think of, you know, the, when I think of hyper masculinity and, and the culture that we're in, I, I want to see some of that. I want to see, I want to see a tempering effect of that happening. And that, you know, the, like, I think, like you said, getting in touch with our feminine side as men is such an important thing. And so, but I also have to remember that, you know, there are people who react against that, who have, they don't even know that they're, you know, people, when you're, when you're, when you're encased in a society, you don't know that you're, you know, that you're in it. You know, the, the fish doesn't know it's in the water. <laughs> doesn't know what water, you know, yeah. it's just the, cla there. the classic example, <laughs> the classic example. It doesn't know yeah. it's in the water. And so I, uh, it's important to be both have a critical mind, but a, 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 a charitable mind as well. Like you have to, it's, that's, I think a difficult thing in our society is to, to, to be, charitable and critical at the same time in, in proper balance, because uh, it's a little frightening actually what's happening in our culture that everybody you know, doesn't matter what point of view you're taking. Everybody is taking a very aggressive and destructive stance toward other things. And, 
you know, I, I see it reminds me of that, you know, the thing that happened with Sarah Silverman a few years ago where there was a guy trolling her on her, I think it was on her Twitter or something. I don't have Twitter. I don't use it, but, and, um, and he was just a trolling, tro- trolling her and, and calling her all kinds of names. And, and she did something really smart, which she you reached out to him. And it's like, you know, something's you're hurting, you're hurting. Like there's something, there's clearly something in your life that, that is, is hurting you. You're, you're in pain. Like what is causing all this pain that would make you attack me? And he just complete any, he completely opened up, you know, and, and started talking to her about his pain and his attitudes change. You know, he was, uh, it's, a, it, that's hard to do. It's really hard to do, but, mm-hmm. um, I don't, but I'm not, I, I don't think, any, you know, I'm not a, a person to give any prescriptive, uh, for the, for the audience or for anyone, but it's just something I think about, you know, my, being too judgmental, charitable. Am I like, how much am I really, you know, how much, how much am I balancing those things? You know, it's a tough, it's tough. Yeah. You it's know, tough. you know, what was really interesting and my girlfriend and I were talking about it is there was a specific Ted talk that she told me to watch. Mm-hmm. And we always get into these conversations about um, the patriarchy and how it affects culture and how it affects both men and women in these various ways. And there is this Ted talk. Um, I forget. Let me, let me look up the person. Well, one of the questions there too is um, where does it even come from? Like, where does the patriarchy come from? Like, where is this, how, how did this develop? And you know, that, that, that history is still being written you know, and, and, and trying to, trying to understand it is not an easy task. But uh, yeah, I'd be curious to to, to listen to that. I'll, I'll listen to it today when when we're done with this interview. I'll go and my get to work and listen to that. The person's name is Paula Stone Williams, and she is a transgender woman who mm. used to be, I believe, a pastor at this church. And mm, interesting, it's funny. She said something that um, uh, she she gives this analogy of climbing a ladder as a metaphor. And she said, you know, it's interesting to be climbing a ladder, only realizing that the wall that you want to climb is on the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think she's talking about, that's, you know, that's these, pretty great. These, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but anyways, the, the reason why I bring this up is because she talks about her experience from being a woman or you know what mm-hmm. pe- you know people um, identifying her, and then also her perspective of when you know she was seen as a man, right? Right. So, right. And being able to say how the patriarchy actually exists from her own unique experience, mm-hmm. and I thought, yeah, I thought it was a really uh, interesting talk because, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's even called "I Lived as a Man and a Woman." Here's what I've learned. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is the, uh, this will be very interesting to listen yeah. to. I'll, I'll enjoy that. Yeah. And, you, and look, yeah. we're, we're just touching on gender. We haven't even talked about, you know, uh, the racial categories and all these other you know, things that we, that are, you know, when we talk about toxic masculinity, we're talking about a particular version of that. Right. And, um, in a, you know, in a white dominated society. So uh, it's, I don't, I think as an artist, the, my my thinking about this is I don't I don't have answers right I don't uh, like for example one of the things I'm I'm exploring right now with my work I'm taking a bit of a shift uh, it, I'm going to be doing I'm doing a series of pieces they're not really ready for for prime time I've show I've teased on Instagram a little bit but I haven't shown the the full ideas but what I'm doing is thinking about cultural shifts the idea of things flipping over and things transitioning to another phase, which is what we're doing. Culture is always doing this. And it was partly, uh, partly w- was, was driven by my thoughts about my daughters, right? That they're in this stage where they're not children, they're not quite adults yet. They're in this funny category called teenager that we invented about a hundred years ago because we didn't, we lost all the rituals of moving from childhood to adulthood. Mm-hmm. And we drew that, that period out. Like that ritual is now 10 years long. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and (laughs) (laughs) right before it was like, you, you you had your ritual as a bar mitzvah and you're "You're not a kid anymore. You're an adult. I'm not starting like adult. We don't do that anymore. We, we've kind of stretched it out. But anyway, I find it interesting that they're in this, this transitional phase and changing and, 
And so, uh, in fact, I'm doing two pieces with my daughters right now. They're over here. And uh, they're on my, the teasers of them are on my Instagram. But I've been thinking about that a lot and how, how those shifts in, in roles and changing how we view masculinity are happening. And I have a whole series of pieces I'm working on with that. But having said that, none of it is, ad, I'm not advocating a particular position. I'm just like from an artist's point of view, just observing this thing that's happening in our culture. And, and, and part, of, part of the reason I, I, I think that way in terms of my process is I, I want to avoid this coming across as being propagandistic to a certain point of view. But secondly, I'm working it from the assumption that I just gave, which is that I'm in the water too. Mm. <laughs> that, uh, who am I to say that I understand it anybody any better than anybody else or that mm -hmm. I'm the one who can give the prescription for how to solve these things or that I can fully advocate for all of those variables within the cultural shifts that are happening. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not in that position. I have some, some feelings about it, but... Uh, but I, I have to acknowledge that I'm in those waters too. In the same way that we, when we were talking about the gays, like I have to, uh, I am in those waters, you know, I'm, I'm there. I want to, I want to step back and observe that aspect of the culture and exact aspect of me and what it means to be in relation to the, uh, to somebody else hmm. and so forth. And so, you know, again, I'm not, I don't speak for anybody. I don't even, I don't even speak for myself when I'm making things. I speak about things. I'm, I'm trying to understand in my own way where, where we are and mm -hmm. where I am. And uh, so yeah, that, that's a, that's a fascinating topic. And this is one of the reasons I think we live in an exciting time because not only is art, like I said earlier, very wide open and it's an incredible variety of different approaches and cultural experiences being expressed, but we're also in this great time of upheaval and change, which, um, which can be an advantage, you know, stasis yeah. isn't always the best thing for art. It's true. Yeah. It's not always yeah, the best thing. It's true. Yeah. So. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for being on the podcast. I appreciate you taking this time and, you know, sharing your you're thoughts. Welcome. You're and, welcome. Yeah. And having this dialogue. You're, well, th th yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for, for having me on. It's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed getting to know you and you too. Your, your, your take on lots of things. It's been great. I've enjoyed it. And I, I like, I really enjoy listening to the podcast. I'm, I'm behind on, on the episodes, but I'm enjoying catching up. It's been fun. Oh yeah. Anything after hundred is probably good. So just go there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've said that in the past, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a learning curve to this thing. Um, yeah, just like yeah. anything. No, but, uh, no, sure. I, I appreciate it. And yeah, let's definitely continue the conversations and curious what you think about that movie, but I'll send you this uh, Ted talk as well. Yeah. After our fantastic, after the zoom call. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. All right. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Okay. All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Creative producer is Noah Wainwright. YouTube and creative support is by Tyler Scully. Research is by Nibba Akireti. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time.